Well, it's nice to see so many of you here this rather damp morning. And we come to the end of another year with much to be grateful for, but not quite prepared for the great leap into the next century. At the present time, we are being shown, as never before in the history of humanity, what is necessary and why. Unfortunately, however, much of this information is being neglected. It's being ignored. While thousands and millions of human beings attempt to do business as usual. We therefore feel that it is important to conceive and consider the problem of religion in the next century. In the 19th century, it accomplished some good, but a great deal of misunderstanding. And we have continually confused religion with theology. They are not the same thing. They are not even intimately related. Theology is a concept of systems. Theologies are systems of worship, but they do not necessarily have any foundation in the philosophy of religion. Religion is a large term to include all human beings as essentially descended from one spiritual source. Theological thinking is different. It is still concerned with the great number of human beings, but they believe theologically in a competition of sources. Each one feels that it alone originated in the divine experience. They continue centuries after century to compete for which is the holiest among them. And this competition has not only disturbed the religious world, but has done much to contribute to the miseries of our political and industrial systems. We are very largely divided in our convictions about the realities of things. And unless something is done to overcome this division, we will never be able to cooperate in a new world order of thinking. As a result of being ordained to the ministry in 1922, I think I have a fair experience of what is happening and what has happened in the theological sphere. We are still massively divided. We are still attempting to convert each other from one sect to another. Each group believes firmly that it has the direct wire with the infinite. And in addition to these group assignments, we have major world religions which are in conflict and are continuing to emphasize the infallibility of their own beliefs above all other convictions of human beings. This, in a way, is very silly. I remember in the Juvena Mashtad at Delhi, the great Muslim mosque, an attendant of the mosque took me through the buildings. And he spoke English and was therefore considered to be a proper guide. As we were leaving, he turned to me with a smile and he said, You know, I don't believe that Muhammad could get in here. (laughs) Everything was tied up in beliefs, tied up in sanctions, sanctified statements, sanctified not by truth, but by the authority of a descent of hierarchical personalities. It is the same everywhere. And the sad part of it all is that there is and can be only one religion. There never has been but one. And it is the evolution of this one that has given the impression of manyness. We are still worshipping the same as our remote ancestors with their totems and with their ancient witchcraft. It is simply that religion has grown up through the believers until today it has ascended 
about as far as a divided acceptance can take it. We are not a different belief from the Greeks or the Romans. We have simply added or unfolded the theology of that time and created the theology of this time. The problem that we are faced with is to find the religion of the future, to find where we must go from here to make religion work in our world. Religion is essentially man's inward conviction of the reality of a divine power. Religion affirms that the final and ultimate authority for existence is a divine power. Now to some this power is a being, to some it is a principle, to some it is a law, and to some it is a mystical experience. But in every case we affirm that the evolution of the world is real and that this evolution is the unfolding of a divine principle through all the avenues and attitudes and paths of human life. This religious unfoldment includes art, music, literature, economics, philosophy, politics, everything. It is all one reality growing up in an unbelieving world. Now as long as nature will control these things, as long as the human being didn't exist, Nature went along living its own rules. It never broke its own laws. It never attempted to. It simply unfolded its principles and its policies according to a pattern or principle resting in a divine power. When the human being came along, he was appointed as a gardener in this great world of human and superhuman achievements. He was supposed to take care of this garden and to bestow upon the law an understanding of the purpose of it so that the flowers and plants and trees that grew would gradually come to know why they grew and how they grew and how they could prevent their own growth. Gradually, mankind took over. But instead of seeking in the laws of nature for the solution to natural problems, he sought within human competition for the answers to problems which that competition could not bestow. So we have today a world with several great religions, most of them essentially morally good. The, uh, there's a little ch chapel, or used to be, whether it's there now I don't know, on the side of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. I went there, and in that... Uh, little chapel with the Ten Commandments in ta on tablets in many different languages, all essentially the same. The virtues of one faith are the virtues of all faiths. The religion philosophies are all part of one teaching. And it is impossible to divide the truths of spiritual reality without, in a sense, tearing apart the single and simple garment of reality. We are all part of one great purpose, and nearly every religion recognizes this purpose, recognizes a divine principle at the source of life, and that this principle finally will and must be obeyed. Now, as materialism developed in society, the individual began to strengthen his own ego and weaken the universal plan. He decided that he could make history, when in actual history was only his own mistakes. Actually, therefore, instead of unfolding our true inner knowledge of the reality of things, we built a complete physical empire, giving it authority over everything, and declared this uh, physical empire to be truth, reality and that it contained essential purpose and the fulfillment of principles, and that by means of this great mechanistic structure we could achieve all things possible to the human being. We have had this concept gradually evolving for the last three or four hundred years, and in the last fifty years the concept has begun to fall apart from the obvious fact that it was not true. We have tried to take over 
the rulership of the universe without understanding the universe or ourselves. We have tried to play God when we had no real understanding of the principles and powers of deity. Therefore, we are in an emergency, and this emergency could be very fatal to us if we do not remedy it in entering into the new century that is at hand. Now, why is it obvious that this change is essential? Why do we feel it's important to make things new before this century comes to an end? The answer is pretty obvious. We have a very short time to make certain corrections in our own behavior or we will endanger the survival of the planet on which we live. We are capable of destroying ourselves for the first time in recorded history. There has always been a time when we could destroy something. We could destroy a family, a country, a nation, a race. But never before have we been in a position to turn this ball in space into an uninhabitable sphere, something that can no longer support life. Not because this was the original plan, but because human perversity has destroyed the essential foundations of survival. So we are trying to explore all these different areas to find out how we can establish a better foundation upon which to build a future for us all. And I think that we must accept religion as a major factor in this program. It has been a major cause of trouble from the beginning, and it must be able to cause a correction of its own mistakes. It must put straight those things which it itself has made crooked and unreasonable. We therefore say that if we look carefully, we will find that most of the wars that were fought before the beginning of the present century were wars dominated or motivated by religion or justified by it. We have had millions of horrible offenses committed in the name of the love of God. We led the Crusades into the Holy Land to rescue the sacred site of Jerusalem and Nazareth from the infidel. But we never made a crusade to take the infidel out of our own hearts. We remained the same. The Crusades failed utterly, and probably the most terrible and tragic of them all, the Child's Crusade, was when thousands of little children, without age or knowledge, were sent on this terrible journey to the Holy Land, and most of them died en route. This everything was done possible to perpetuate this terrible feud between beliefs. Now we have come again in this present century to a feud of beliefs. We have just gone through a very heartbreaking experience of persecution on the grounds of religion. After thousands of years, after the fall of the Roman Empire, after the collapse of Greece and Egypt, after the complete failure of medievalism, after the miseries of the Crusades, we are out again on the verge of holy wars. It is unbelievable that we can suffer so much and learn so little. But after all, nature will not permit this condition to go on forever. Either we must change our ways, or day by day we will come closer to the annihilation of all that has been good and proper in our way of life. So with this in mind, we have to say, what are we going to do to help religion to bring about a unification of human purpose. Well, the first thing we must try to do is to get religion to stop dividing humanity, stop actually creating the very discords which are causing the greatest amount of trouble. We are in the presence now of heavy religious influence, which is largely theological. It is a definite battle for competition for the grace of God. And on the name, in the name of this grace of God, to conspire leadership in world politics. So what are we going to think about religion? Let us first of all come to the simple conclusion that the mind, in this case, has definitely been the slayer of reality. It is the mind using words in various languages that has accepted names as different 
and capable of being the source of religious conflict. In other words, God is a perfectly good word, but Allah is the name of a heathen divinity. It is perfectly all right to believe in Jehovah, but not to believe in Brahma. And if we believe in Brahma, we must be saved by those who believe in Jehovah, and those who believe in Jehovah must be saved by those who believe in Brahma. It has never occurred to these people, apparently, that these are words, not gods, and that from the beginning we have given different names to the same thing. And every time a new dimension of deity appears to us, we give it a new name. Therefore, God has become an infinitely growing principle, developing and growing on the basis of human experience in a material world. We've had no time, no energy, and no thought to discover the common ground upon which all of these various beliefs rest. We are worshipping in terms of language. We are worshipping in terms of instruments that were created in the past under other names, but which actually represent the same power and the same principle. There is a master language of comparative religion. If we could understand that, and, if I, and apply it, we would find that the brotherhood of humanity, spiritually speaking, has never actually been damaged except by our own misunderstandings. Therefore, on the night, probably, and we hope, in the 21st century, that man will actually experience the reality of one God, that he will realize that the universe is not made up of various real or unreal deities struggling for rulership we will come to realize that the actual spirit of God is something that cannot be put into common words if we depend upon language. That is the reason why it is put to music or is experienced in art. It's because in words, we cannot overcome the differences that words imply or infer in our thinking. We therefore worship the names of things not realizing that these things are one in spite of the diversity of the names. There is only one creating power. There is no anti-power to destroy it. There is no reality that is inconsistent with decency. And there is no escape from the immutability of a divine purpose by which this world was fashioned. The power that created the world, that created the universe, that created all the vast inhabitants of space. The same deity that watches each sparrow's fall is one power, one tremendous, infinite, creative and protective benevolence, one unchanging principle of good, existing always for the fulfillment of its own purpose. And all of these creatures are part of the unfoldment of the perfect purpose of the eternal deity. This we can actually accept. It is not necessary for us to change our churches, go somewhere else. We are perfectly entitled to attend such worship as we desire. But let us try to achieve the realization that the person in the other church is worshiping the same God under another name. We've got to get rid of the mythology of the past in which all the gods in heaven are fighting all the nations of the earth. There are no fighting gods over the cities of today as the deities battled over the walls of Troy. There is only man, the law, and his own misunderstandings. These misunderstandings have been sanctified and justified by actively creating creeds to perpetuate misunderstandings. And to some degree at least, nearly all denominations permit the perpetuation of some type of, of, mis of, of misunderstanding. They acknowledge and admit differences in basic principles, and these differences are creedal. But these creedal differences have no reality in the presence of truth. So we are going to try some way to create a concept of truth to carry forward into the new century at hand. And among all the problems that we face is the greatest of all, the experience of religious unity. We've got to find some way 
of discovering that the heavens above us are not at war with themselves as well as with the earth. Now when we try to achieve this type of unity, I think that probably the best way to approach it is to realize that there are two ways of finding God. That is, there are, there are the ways by of worship and the ways of mysticism and revelation. Religion will never be complete for the individual until he perfects it within himself. He cannot find the security that he needs in the world around him or in the teachings of the world around him. Uh, we all know, and in my years of experience personally, we know perfectly well that the average person is not really actually living what he says he believes. He claims to believe that he is part of one family, but he is just going through his third divorce. He believes that his children should be brought up right, but they didn't interfere with his own activities, so he forgets or ignores them. He believes that we should have marriage, so he doesn't marry. All these things we do every day, claiming that there are laws that are real, but these laws interfere with the most important thing that we cling to, and that is the concept of the right to do as we please. The individual believes firmly that he is free to be himself at all times, regardless of the consequences of this freedom upon those around him. In the last analysis, the only individual individuality of which we are capable, the only freedom that we have, is the freedom of mistake. The reality is there is no freedom. There is no need for it. How can you escape from truth? Why should you want to? The only reason the individual attempts to escape from reality is because he has an unreality of his own that he wishes to cherish. He wishes to do as he please in a world in which he must do as he should or else suffer. We see around us today the infinite consequences of personal selfishness, personal ambition, personal corruption, and we also see that it is leading us inevitably to an end that we do not even want to think about. We thought we had come to the end of it with nuclear fission. Now we realize that there's another end we haven't even guessed at, and that is a possible world conflict in germicides, in plagues, in pestilences, which we can manufacture to destroy each other. This type of thinking should sober somebody. It should represent another step in man's final determination to destroy himself and his world. Now, all of this is not really due to the fact that everybody is bad. It is not due that we are to the fact that some demon is whispering in our ear to contribute to our corruptions. It is simply due to certain basic attitudes which the human being has carried with him since the beginning of his existence, which he has been warned of a million times, but continues to practice at the extent of the common good. These mistakes invariably and inevitably lead, lead to his own misfortune, his own miseries, his own death, but he never realizes that he is the cause of them and the only one who can cure them. In other words, if we wish to survive as a world, we've got to stop the happy, pleasant, self-satisfying way of self-destruction that we are now following. We cannot keep on watching terrible television. We cannot keep on watching all the corruptions of society and learning nothing from them and under temptation doing the same thing ourselves. The time has come that we've either got to discover a spiritual value in our own natures and do something about it or we're never going to be able to build this new world that we so gravely hope to find. We have to begin with right now to start a new attitude towards values. Now, what do we really need at the moment? We need what most of the socialist countries are now discovering. They are discovering that without ideals, they are going to go down. 
most of the so-called successful uh, uh, communistic states are in desperate trouble. And the only thing that can take them out of trouble is the thing they have denied, a creative idealism and dedication to principle. The principles they tried to dedicate themselves to were so far down on the list of realities that they could not possibly accomplish the end that was desired. Therefore, we now find, actually, on almost all levels, a bankruptcy of materialism. Very closely with it, the bankruptcy of the cause of it, economic uh, profit abuse. All these things are here. They're getting worse. And we've got to do something about them if we wish to hand this planet over to the 21st century with some hope of survival. We also are now building into our lives, into our world, small children who must face this. We may be with them for a while to help them. But the world is going to inherit the substance of our mistakes. And it's about time for them to inherit a legacy of value rather than a legacy of uh, de decay and pain. So we're going to do something about our religions. We're going to start in recognizing that each one of us must in his own way make his own statement of constructive belief. He has to make this statement to himself, he has to mean it, and he has to live by it. He has to either believe that there is a divine principle of good or do, does not believe this. If he does not believe it, he must be willing to face the consequences of that agnostic or atheistic acceptance. He, what will they be, he may ask. And you can answer him very simply. Look around you and see. The mistakes are already bringing a harvest of pain and misery. They are forcing the change of principles. They are leading away from all of this great social experiment that we have talked about and are leading back to the fact that the individual, the mother, with the small child in her arms, is praying for peace. She does not want to see her child go out and become merely a, a name in, on a grave. These things, we can see the mistakes of what we're doing. They're coming in by the million. We can see all of the problems that we have misused. And now, we have a, a nice period, about 10, 12 years, to try to do something about this, to change this policy and make it right, to have some value sense for the future. We've got to begin to recognize the difference between doing as we want to and perishing, or doing as we should and surviving. There's going to be a clear-cut division. And little by little, we are building an arsenal that can end survival. And if we use that arsenal, we will not survive. Therefore, we now have a period of a decade or more in which to d determine that that arsenal shall never be used that we will no longer consider this type of solution. We will not believe that we get rid of an enemy by killing him, or that we believe that we, believe that we will get over a nation by invading it. Uh, we will find that all our destructive purposes come back on our heads like black birds going under the eaves to roost. We cannot hope to do by evil that which can only be accomplished by good. We also know that religion is the one phase of knowledge that we possess that, in, that invites us to contemplate the mysteries of eternity. We have eternal space for science, eternal wealth for economy, eternal power for policy, but we also have eternal mysticism for survival. We have to find our way home. We have to find our roots, and these roots are not in the uh, pocketbooks or the stock exchange. These roots are in the integrities of human nature. Now, where are these integrities? At the moment, their natural repose is to rest quietly in the inner consciousness of man himself. The soul in the human being is the repository of that good 
which is necessary for the redemption of the personality. In every individual, the, sa the soul is the savior. And the coming of the soul into power is the coming of the world God, the world series savior. So we know that somewhere within each of us there is locked the divine power to redeem ourselves. This power is our redemption. This is our mysterious deity. This is the power that can transform and transmute, that can raise the dead, cast out evil, heal the sick, and nourish and feed the multitudes. It is all in the soul. And it is the annual birth of the soul in this world, so-called, that is the sacrament of Christmas. It is the Christmas principle that each year the soul restates its authority over the body and life of mankind. In other words, Christmas is a symbol of the annual rebirth of the human soul or of the divine soul, which is the substance of the human soul. Actually, we are therefore always in the presence of our salvation. We do not have to be dipped or sprinkled in order to be baptized. What we actually have to be is touched by the soul within ourselves. It is necessary that at that moment that this transformation be the transformation of the water into wine, the symbol of the dominance or victory of the eternal over the temporal, the victory of eternity over the illusions of time. All of these things are part of a space religion. We are talking about space conquest. It's time to let inner space conquer outer space. And inner space is soul. It is the mysterious power that animates everything. It is the soul in the planet, in the sun, in the galaxy. It is the soul in man, and in the beast, and in the little plant in the, in the garden. Everywhere there is a power of life struggling to fulfill itself against the ignorance and darkness and selfishness of humanity. There is no principle of evil. There is only man misusing good. The abuse of the greatest good is the greatest abuse of all. So in trying to get ready for the next century, there are things we've got to do. One of them is we've got to get spiritual values to children. We've got to find ways of getting over the idea that materialism is the security of child life. The only reason why we're leaving uh, or ignoring religion in the teaching of the young is because it will interfere with the victory of corruption. We do not think of it that way. But we know that if an individual has right principles, he will not be exploited on the basis of temptations to corrupt those principles. Therefore, we need some kind of idealistic teaching to bring to us the security of young people's lives. In many nations, this does exist to some degree. But in the so-called world powers, it is all being sacrificed in terms of profit and defense. And the profit is not certain, and the defense is impossible. Therefore, we are just drifting along nearer and nearer to a day of judgment that we do not really want to face, even though we ignore the problems involved. So we need, we need something for young people. Now, the most natural and proper thing for young people is not that we shall pass a law. This is one of our ways of escaping virtue, is to pass laws. The more laws we pass, the more corruption we have. The, we should not have a law to teach young people how to live. That is the prime purpose, the glory of parents. It is the small child learning from those whose example it respects, learning to live right from parents who live right. This is the only way it can be done. No matter how much foolishness and corruption and, and lack of integrity parents may have, there is no social order that can correct this for the young person. It, the, the, the determination lies with the individual. I think uh, Confucius summed it up personally in a very great statement, namely, that no nation 
is more secure than the integrity of its private families. There is no nation that is stronger than the most corrupt of its social institutions. The, the need for corruption, correction here is very real. Comenius, the great educator of the 17th century, who gave us the public school system, makes definite note that the public school system is a kind of graduate institution to which the child goes for a type of education, having received the basis of integrities in his home before he is seven years old. Where are these people? The parent doesn't know what to teach. The parent hasn't been taught. The child isn't taught. The child's children will not be taught. And so it will go on until the first line of defense against disintegration disintegrates itself. This is one of the great problems we have to face, that we've got to start with children before they are spoiled, before they are ruined. And we cannot do it by legislation. We cannot put a policeman at the side of the cradle when the child is born. We cannot demand these things from parents whose only interest is in themselves. Therefore, the integrities of this level have to be under religion. They have to be the print basic values of faith. Faith being something that changes people for the better. And this is the beginning of the child's growth. And when it goes into school, it has another problem to face. It has the problem of being taught how to live instead of how to die. In school, the child should receive a basic idealistic outlook toward values and the responsibility that that child itself takes in, in becoming a citizen of its world, of its community. There has to be idealism in school or there will not be any in life. Now we get to the point perhaps where we cannot control this any longer. Perhaps this, this child is already on its own and breaking the rules of propriety simply on the basic fact that everybody else breaks them. Then we have another problem, that of various therapies and in, in, in employment. Employers have a, mo a moral responsibility also to measure and, in, and protect and integrate the characters of those who work for them. The individual who works for a business, the business itself being dishonest or dishonorable, is simply adding to his own troubles. And that business is adding to its ultimate bankruptcy. So then we get older, and they become more and more mature in thinking. But always the essence is to strengthen the victory of the ideal over the materialistic to gain a sense of the courage of conscience rather than the, the fear which leads us all into various corruptions and compromises. So, we have this in, the, in children, we have it in adults, we have it in jobs, we have it in society, and it comes back at us through entertainment, through literature, through art, and through everything that we know in environment, all of which at the present time is in a miserable state of decadence. All these things we see, but we do not have the strength to do anything about them. We will try to vote for someone to do it for us. They will get the job and then be convicted a few weeks later for <laughs> absconding with the funds. There's no answer in this. The answer is if there's some difficulty at hand, we must do it. We cannot put this on to someone else because if we do, we will not only get something we can't use, but we will also place another person in jeopardy and let them suffer and perhaps be martyred for principles we should be living every day. So this is not the answer. The answer is very definitely the realization that within ourselves is the power to make realities just as easily as we make disasters. If we have an endless style of doing it wrong, we also have within ourselves the infinite power to do it right. And we must call upon this power more and more. When in doubt, do not try to change society. 
try to change your own ideals. Get inside of yourself and find out what the lesson is that you should be learning. Not the lesson of how to get out of it and remain the same, but the uh, lesson of how to correct the situation so it will never return. These things we have to face constantly. Now as we come on to the educational system, we go into all of the arts and practices and education and we come upon another dimension of religion, one that is very favorable, that's very definite, very useful to us, and that is that religion is the power that will give the person the character to do an eight hours day's work properly. A religion will give, cause the individual to realize his moral duty uh, to be true to his job if it is a good job and if it isn't get out of it. But the uh, moral and spiritual value is that it makes him an, in, an honest worker, an honest citizen, an honest member of the community, an honest voter when the time comes. But the individual must be under the control or under the direction of his own integrity. Now, how does he find this integrity? Well, most of the mystics have come the hard way. They have found integrity through pain, suffering, privation. They have also found it through martyrdom. The way of the Lord is not easy, but it is easier than what is happening now. And while a little happiness now ends to destruction, a little serious sacrifice in the cause of truth can lead to an infinite fulfillment and protection. The individuals who will work together honorably and honestly may be a little poorer in money, but they will not be among those who do the wailing and gnashing of teeth when things go wrong. Actually, therefore, the reformation of all things lies within ourselves. We must find the facts. Each of us is here with a different problem, but we are in a world in which all problems are handled, and we are here in which there is a solution for our problem. Not only a solution, but a fulfillment of growth, integrity, and peace as a result of outgrowing our own stupidity and ignorance. So we have all these things as part of the challenge of religion. Now, there's no reason, however, that we should do all this the hardest possible way. There are ways in which we can simplify situations so that the pains and miseries of growth are far less acute. One of the simplest things we can start with is to get over the idea that a religion has anything to do with its own name. As one of the great philosophers of the past said, there are 72 names for God, but only one God. We've got to learn that in religious uh, practice, the different sects and uh, groups, the maiden religions and the little splinters, all of them have a spiritual code or conviction. And basically, this conviction is identical in all of them. It changes in wording because of difference in language. It changes in customs because of difference in environments. But it remains the same morally and ethically. It always has been and always will be. There has never been a major religion in the world that taught anything except basic integrities. And then in cause and the time, these have been compromised. Various theologies have come, become rich in worldly power. They become glorious. They become whoops, splendid and try to dominate all the others. But when it gets up to this stage, it's like the rich man who has more trouble getting into heaven than a camel to the eye of a needle, as we've learned from the scripture. Incidentally, there is a needle gate, and it was, in Jerusalem. And that gate was so narrow that if a camel went through, it had to take off its load. And that was the moral lesson. The camel could get through, but what it had carrying with it could not. To learn that we have not, we cannot depend upon what we have to get this thing cleaned up. We've got to depend upon what we are and do it. And when we go in to find out what we are, perhaps we will discover we need a little refreshment along the way. We have so long gone on the basis of doing as we please that we do not realize that salvation 
is a snack exact science. It is a great religion, it is a great mystery, it is a great philosophy, it is a great policy, but it is also a great science. In science, if you do a certain thing, you get a certain result. In morality, if you act in a certain way, the consequences will follow. And uh, there is no way of escaping them. So in the daily thinking of religion, we have to realize that there are things we have to do there are principles we have to keep and there are most of all changes that we must make in ourselves as far as the ancients were concerned and we've done very little better there is no essential virtue in membership no matter what you belong to you can make the same mistakes and they're being made all over the world by every believer and all the non-believers also because the mistakes are simply selfishness the individual intends to do what he intends to do and he would like to do it in a way that would enable him to become rich and famous. These, the, these motives are present wherever the world changes at the present time. But in addition to this type of thing, we have the, the definite realization that all these different principles have to be done. How many people do we actually know who believe in the Ten Commandments and yet at the same time will not almost daily compromise one of them in order to do something they want to do. I know one case in which uh, the, the symbolism is quite obvious. A person coming out of church, talking to another person coming out of church, points out someone up in front who's just come out of church and says, I can't stand that unbearable woman. And they've just come out of a Christian church when they say it. Now something is wrong. And yet it would be almost impossible to prevent that person from saying, well, she is impossible. But this isn't the point. And nothing seems to change as a result of sermonizing. Sometimes it does. It has its use. But it's not going to be the answer to the problem at the moment. We are not going to be made whole by preachment. We are going to be made whole by the discovery for the first time, as far as modern man is aware, that the whole government lies within ourselves. That we have the right to live right regardless of anything. And that we have right to enjoy right living to the same extent that we now usually enjoy breaking a good rule. We like now to break rules. That gives us freedom, gives us a sense of superiority. When in reality, keeping rules gives us the fact of personal survival in all emergencies. There is no reason why religion cannot make people happy. There is no reason why there has to be a Spanish Inquisition in which half a country is slain to take care of a theological belief. There is no need for inquisitions. There is no need for these tremendous uh, crusades in which tens of thousands died. All these things are passed off as heroic examples of, hero of religion. What they are is, are is an example of what happens when you try to avoid personal responsibility. When you're willing to go out and die for a faith, but you won't go home and live a belief that is suitable to the perpetuation of your society. These things we have to do something about. We are now moving into a sphere of practicality. Every branch of knowledge has got to prove that it does something permanently right. It has got to prove, as science must, that science is making us better people, not richer people. We have to have politics that makes us true to the highest principles of statesmanship and not something to be used for personal advantage. If we have money as we know it today, we must be having it to prove conclusively that we, you, uh, we do know and understand the right use of it. Everywhere right usage or right action must come into dominance. Now it's not as bad as it sounds. Most people think that sounds pretty terrible. But it does not sound nearly as bad as the mess we're in right now. Because for a little effort we can perhaps enjoy and, and build a quiet community security whereas at the present time in our desperate effort 
to protect an ignorant relationship with life. We are gradually moving ourselves off of the planet. So we have all these things to think about, but religion has to be a part because it is the only branch of learning that we have or the only area in which we, we, we connect or communicate with the inner realities of life. We have a soul power and a mystical experience and we have the possibility of gradually experiencing the inward reality of the immediate presence of God. We do not know whether other people will see it that way or not. They will have their own experience. But whatever the experience will be, it is an experience of the same divine power. Their experience will look different, but it must be the same as all others. All who have a mystical experience must finally come to the same conclusion. And if they come to an opposite conclusion, it's because their own subconscious pressure is permitting them to continue to maintain an illusion. Therefore, if we are right, inside of ourselves there is a power to help us to stay that way and to spread that right and to do as we should with it with other people. If we are unable to make that strong adjustment, then the time has come for us to send our own souls to school. It is time definitely for us to take hold of our own lives and begin to make it straight. If it isn't straight enough for us, then we must make it straight. Usually, however, this isn't the problem at all. We don't have to really reform the soul. The real troublemaker in the whole situation is the mind. The mind is the slayer of the real, says the Bhagavad Gita. And this is our problem. The victory of the mind over the soul is our trouble. The victory of the soul over the mind is redemption. As long as the mind is constantly conspiring for its own advantages, the soul is, suffers in silence. It is imprisoned within a cage of intellect. It is the servant in which we use it only to support what we want to believe. And under those conditions, the real soul has no chance. A false belief cannot be part of the soul. It must arise in the mind and be supported by the emotions, but it cannot arise from the depths of the consciousness at the source of human life. Behind everything that we see and see and know and experience, there is a spark of life. What that spark of life is, no scientist has dared to guess. That spark of life is in the stars, in space, in the infinite. Where it comes from, no one knows. But it is an infinite spark of infinite life. And the little foray of that spark shines in the soul of every person. This does not mean that every person has a separate spark of God in them. But it means that all persons together are one person with one spark of one God, regardless of what they think, believe, or try to do. But there is this power within us that does all kinds of wonders for all kinds of creatures. It puts the color in the wings of butterflies. It gives the urges of, to life and expressed through, the, through plants, through flowers, through everything. There is only one life, and that one life is orderly, that one life is lawful, that one life has only one purpose, the perfection of all that lives. And either we find out a little about keeping that law, though we may not understand it, that we do not recognize it and obey its laws as they manifest in daily living, we will be in serious trouble. We can never find a human will or a human mind strong enough to protect us when the need for the discovery of soul power comes upon us. We have to have the power of the soul. And this soul is the infinite wisdom, love, and truth of life which has to come. Now, we've fought it a long time. We see now that the Chinese are beginning to realize that they were wrong. They don't read the Mao's little red book anymore because they discovered that he didn't know as much as he thought he knew. And they thought he knew. But they did not get the answer because Mao could not get down on his knees 
and pray for light. Now we have the same thing in, in Russia. Their socialism is tottering, is in trouble. Their system will not work because they have exiled deity or at least have made deity unimportant in the development of a sociology. So they are in trouble and they will always be in trouble. Again, every government will be in trouble. And we have troubles here. They have troubles in every country of the world because of the victory of self-will over divine will. They have determined to do things their way. And their way was always in terms of fame and profit. They wanted to create a world in a sandbox. They have forgotten that the creation process has already accomplished this. We have the world, the best world that there can ever be, if we may make it that way. But this idea that we can change things by ignoring realities is a dead and lost cause. So gradually, in a mysterious way, religion is sneaking back. Ideals are sneaking back. Now we've got another job to consider. They should not sneak back into their old form. They should not go back into the orthodoxies which are no longer acceptable. They should go forward to the realization of the one divine truth at the source of all that lives. They should march forward to the experience of God and not back to rambling over theologies. We do not want more sects to come up. We do not want more pathways to be found to lead us across the bridge. What we really need is the experience of the power of the internal good over the external uncertainty. We need to realize the immediate experience of God is the mystical experience which has been present in all the great spiritual teachers of mankind. They have not taught according to fashion. They have not according to profit. They haven't done it in order to take over countries. They have done it in order to fulfill the destiny of the world soul as this world soul is expressed in the conduct of human beings and the laws that are established to take care of our society. So we are here again now on Christmas. A Christmas which is very important. We are here to celebrate the uh, annual birth of the soul. We are here to restate our allegiance to that which is eternal. Now it has been natural and useful to almost always think of Christmas as a child's holiday. We think of it when we must remember the little children and what do we give them? A hum, an armful of presents and toys and enough candy to sicken them for a month. We give them all kinds of things, things everywhere. Yet for all of us, it is proper that Christmas should be a child's holiday. And all of us, including the long gray beards, are children. We are all children. We are all little ones. We're studying in the school of the Holy Spirit. We are all little children who will enjoy the toys of life. And we know that many of these toys are beautiful. We know that we don't have to have toys that are miniature rifles or miniature machine guns. That toys are like life itself. Most of the experiences we live through are the experiences of children playing with toys. We play toys with family. We play toys with our own children. And we make all kinds of toys to please ourselves and others. But in the last analysis, we are all small children glorying in the holiday of the Christmas tree. We are here as a symbol of salvation. The tree itself is apparently, according to tradition at least, the invention of Martin Luther, who was the first to make a Christmas tree and hang various symbols on it to represent the universe and life. He wanted it to be the tree growing in the beautiful forest surrounded by stars and by all the lights of life. So he made the, the Christmas tree as we know it now. But the Christmas tree is a symbol of everlasting life. It is a symbol of giving to those who come after us the blessed gift 
of the wisdom, love and understanding that we have gained and must pass on. The only heritage that one can generation can give to another is the heritage of the experienced realities, has a heritage of greater vision, deeper understanding, broader thinking and kindlier attitudes towards each other. These are the great gifts, the gifts that must now be given. We are on the verge of a new century. We have a Christmas tree that pretty soon we'll remember, we will remember in relation to the 21st century. We are going to go on, but we should understand what this all means. We are passing on to the future, not only our miseries, but our hopes. We are passing on to the future the fulfillment of our dreams and aspirations. But we could not fulfill them ourselves because we could not clear our minds of the selfishness, self-centeredness and ignorance which has afflicted us for the last 2,000 years and probably 10,000 before that. Therefore, what we really have to realize at this time is there is no use passing on to the next generation, just our mistakes or the remedies which we find won't work. We could give them our financial system and they'd go broke. We could give them our educational system and they would remain ignorant. There's no use of trying to pass what we have on to the future in just the way we have it. The future will lindsay die a little sooner and we will all be a little worse. And there are children coming into the world now who have to live in that future and they will have nothing but the miseries we have if we pass on to them only the ways we do things. If we pass on to that generation nuclear fission, if we pass on to that generation poison gas, or world bankruptcy, or feuding of nations, or the master amassing of, of uh, evils, or the massacring of hostages, all these things will be a terrible thing with which to blight the future to blight the unborn years of the ones who are coming in now. What we must try to convert to them, them or convey to them is soul power. We must prove to them for once and for all that we realize we did it wrong. That there is nothing irreparable and nothing terrible about making a mistake. But there is something unfortunate when you make the same mistake repeatedly over a period of ages. Then it gets to be a little ridiculous. We are not going to be blamed for our mistakes. Everyone makes them. The next generation will make its own mistakes, but there's no reason why it should have to make ours. And if we don't do something in the next 10 or 12 years, we're going to pass on something that is as dismal and unsolvable by us as we think it should be solved in some other generation. There is no reason to hope that we can do nothing but pass on a system which we have lost faith in and which is no longer protecting us from the dismal results of our own wrong attitudes. We've got to start in by giving them a little bit of a cleaning up. We've got to give them a little uh, Christmas present too, a little symbol of the fact that we have seen, that we have known, and that we have begun to understand the mystery of the victory of soul over mind and body. We are going to have to give them an example of what it meant to face a problem squarely and fairly and solve it to the best of our possible abilities. We want to pass on a better generation than we have known in this century. And in order to do that, we must realize that, the, that this is idealism. That idealism is another name for the deepest phase of religious belief. Idealism is the experience of the divine purpose in our own daily lives. It is the recognition of the infinite goodness at the source of existence which we have constantly denied and which we are daily destroying. All of these things are part of the, day, of the new age. They are part of the generation that is coming up. And that we are, are responsible not to give that new generation a hopeless heritage. We are worried now concerning the children born today from parents who are not responsible, who are not properly integrated, who are not even healthy, and certainly do not understand the experiences of the inner life. We are worried about these children that are coming now. 
How about the ones that will be ten years old in another ten years? What are we going to do about that? Are they going to go on perpetuating the mistakes of their ancestors? Are they going to have in their veins blood that is sick? Are we going to find them all part of this running down and falling apart world that we are now suffering from? Or are we going to do something about it? It's the time is now, and the time is to prepare the legacy. We go out and buy toys for the kiddies. We bear up a tree, a nice little one like this right here, for our families and our loved ones. We've got to fix up a tree for the Christmas of the year 2001. A tree that contains the flowers of our love and our respect. It contains the wisdom of a repentant people who have suddenly realized the mistakes of ages. We've got to find people in that time who will be able to benefit by our direct and honest affection, by the fact that we are no longer going to make up excuses and have all kinds of wordings to do things, but we're going to straighten it out and we're going to say to our children, uh, here is a clean world that we have polished a little for you, that we've made it right and straight, now you keep it that way. But if we give them a world and say to them, we're in horrible trouble, save us, if you will have to make it right because we can't, we've got another century gone. This uh, means in politics and science and art, music and literature, that we should begin to develop soul power. The soul of music is not hard rock. The soul of art is not post-impressionism. The soul of literature is not one of the present popular novels. All these things are part of a decadence which we have allowed and which is gradually destroying us. And we are going to pass this on to another century by making a very tragic mistake. We are damning the future for the mistakes that we have made. So instead of that, let's, even if we have to go out of our way a little bit, do a little more than we would normally do, Let's try to build into each of our lives as people, as individuals, a, a, a new sense of values, an ability to appreciate the good in other people, um, and, and a greater demand to appreciate the good in beauty, uh, not to patronize or, or turn on the TV on things that are unworthy, that we are no longer out for sensationalism. What we're out for is inspiration. We're out for the uh, strength to do something better than we've ever done it before. Uh, and as individuals to live our own lives a little better than we've ever lived them before. That we're going to forget the animosities and the excuses. We're going to get over the jealousies and, we get, uh, and the ambitions that are unreasonable and gradually try to save this planet from the chaos which is developing in it as a result of our own um, constant mistakes. In the last four or five years, nations have fallen apart. We have had a greater amount of tragedy, pain, and misery than any civilized nation should ever be faced with, or a civilized generation. We find all the old hate springing up again. We find the old corruption stepping in. We are faced with narcotics as never before. We are faced with AIDS. We are faced with all kinds of challenges which very largely add up to our own unwillingness to live straight, an in, an inability to control ourselves. And many of these things are the result of the discouragements and disillusionments we have passed on to children and to others who have lost faith in a world of integrities. We cannot afford to pass that on to the 21st century. If we do, we are going to find that skill without light is going to end in chaos. We will have the ultimate invention, but we will not survive it. So we might just as well begin to think in terms of a little peace and quiet, a little gentleness and a kindly garden. We were given a garden and we have made it a graveyard, not only for bodies but for dreams, for hopes, for, for ideals and for principles. We have taken a magnificent destiny and corrupted it, not necessarily because we were not educated, but because we were not enlightened. 
these things have to be changed. We have time enough to do it. And we, there is something that everyone can do because everyone can start with himself and make sure that he is adding nothing to the common trouble. He can also find ways of expressing the release of his own soul power. The soul power in the individual is the God power in him. In this soul power he can help the sick and the tired and the heavy laden. He can bring peace to the troubled. He can make his own life more constructive. He can end forever the animosities that he has nursed. Maybe they were genuine. Maybe he feels that he was really, really suffering from the deeds of others. But no, uh, no individual who suffers only from the deeds of others uh, can go through this experience unless he nurses that suffering with his own mind. He can forgive. We are told to forgive our enemies. We are told to forgive unto 70 times. Well, most people don't make that one time for forgiveness. And certainly by 70 times we should get rid of it. But we don't. Because we never try 70 times. Actually, we have got to change the practice of our lives. We have got to be controlled by the soul within ourselves, which is the God in us, the hope of glory. It is the deity in our hearts and souls that is that fragment or that little ray from the eternal life which guards all things. In bodies and in nations and races we are divided, but in soul power we are one people, indivisible. And if we can learn to let the soul have victory over the mind and the body, there will be no more war, no more selfishness, no more suffering, no more poverty. But life can become one eternal Christmas time because every moment the eternal is sending blessings and gifts to us but we do not recognize them and we do not know how to use them. So let's make it a very, very good Christmas at this time. Let's try very hard to, be a, to prove that we can go into the next century with a greater understanding and deeper feelings and more universal love for life and people than we've ever had before. If we do not make this, I'm afraid we're going to have very serious trouble. If we do make it, we can be for the first time the people that we were intended to be in the infinite wisdom. Merry Christmas to you all and blessings.